You're everyone's problem. That's because every time you go up in the air, you're unsafe. I don't like you because you're dangerous. That's right. Nice. Man, I am dangerous. Station is more than 14 years old, built by spacewalkers, and continues to be maintained and upgraded through spacewalks in the most advanced spacesuits the world has ever seen. Spacewalks are not, uh, they look like they're incredible fun, and they probably are for the crew member when you really get down to it, but we must never forget how dangerous they are. Is this your idea of fun, man? In 1986, Soviet engineers cracked the problem of building in space and assemble a space station of unprecedented scale. But a structure as big as the International Space Station presents a new challenge. Its size makes it an easy target for accidental collisions. Today, the crew of the International Space Station live with the constant threat of being hit by a flying object. Over 100,000 pieces of discarded rockets and satellites litter the space station's path. This is a real-time image of the deadly orbiting space junk. NASA used radar to track the largest pieces of wreckage and steer the station out of harm's way. But the greatest threat comes from debris that's too small to see. Something as minute as a grain of sand traveling at orbital speed would have enough momentum to rupture the station's hull cause it to depressurize and kill those on board. that was not un unexpected. I felt cold water on the back of my head, and, and that surprised me. I, I contacted the ground, which is the first thing you would do when, when something that you're not expected comes up. So I asked Houston for, for advice. You know, I said, I, I feel water in my helmet, but what it feels like a lot of water. The, the ground doesn't have a lot of information on the suit. They, they can monitor some things, they have telemetry about my status, my battle status, and they, they know how the suit is performing, but a lot of things we, we couldn't tell at that point. Is, is the water increasing in my helmet, in the back of my helmet? I, I couldn't tell. Uh, the ground couldn't tell that we're trying to come up with what could be the possible problem and the solution. Finally uh, came the decision from, uh, from the ground to to take the safest option, which is we are we're going to terminate this EDA. Chris and Luca, just for you guys, uh, based on what we heard with Lucas saying that uh, water is in his eyes now and it seems to be increasing, uh, we think we're going to terminate EVA case for EV2. And so when they told me, OK, Luca, you're going to travel back to the airlock, and Chris is going to clean up and, and then follow you, that's what we did. And I started translating back to the airlock. I had to, to go upside down and translating with my head towards the, the, the ground. And it started up on his six when he pulled through the clouds, and then I moved in above him. Well, if you were directly above him, how could you see him? Because I was inverted. <coughs> I had to, to go upside down and translating with my head towards the, the, the ground. And it always happens. A lot of things happen at the same time. Uh, the sun went down at that, at that point. You go, from, you go to zero. Darkness, no visibility, and cold. Um, and at the same time, the water sloshed around my helmet, and it, and it covered my eyes and, and my nose. 
and my ears. So uh, all at once I was isolated, both being outside in my spacesuit, but I was also sensorially isolated. I couldn't see uh, and I, I couldn't hear and, and I didn't quite know where I was, how to, uh, to find my way back to the, to the airlock. At that point, it, it was obvious to me that I needed to, to go back to the airlock by myself and do it as fast as I could because I could still breathe through my mouth, but I didn't know how much water was in the helmet and I didn't know if there would be more water in the helmet. Thankfully, we, we spent hundreds of hours underwater in the neutral buoyancy lab learning. This water tank at the Johnson Space Center creates a near weightless environment for the astronauts to train in. We call this facility the neutral buoyancy laboratory because uh, in the water we can wear the same suit basically that we wear in space during our spacewalks and the divers that assist us can add weights or styrofoam to our suits and make us neutrally buoyant which feels a little bit like being weightless. In the bottom of this pool sits a replica of the space station. Underwater... I was able to, to find my way in, in the dark, in the blind, um, back to the airlock. Once I found the airlock though, everything became a little better because once I opened a the thermal cover, the airlock is illuminated and that made a huge difference because now I knew, I knew where I was I, and I knew I could get inside by myself. And the end of it was that uh, at that point I had no communication whatsoever. I couldn't, hear my, I couldn't hear anything, I couldn't talk, my ears were filled with water. But, uh, but I was looking up uh, and as soon as they opened the hatch between the space station and the airlock, I saw my crewmates and the look on their faces, they were so worried and, and so relieved at the same time. And they pulled me out and as soon as they could, they, um, they deflated the suit and uh, unlocked the helmet. And, uh, and the look on their faces and seeing their faces was a very happy moment for me. I International Space Station is being used as a proving ground to conduct the research and test the technologies that will take humans beyond low Earth orbit and deeper into the solar system than ever before. To conduct the research and test the technologies that will take humans beyond low Earth orbit and deeper into the solar system than ever before. Finger. Yes, I know the finger, Goose. I'm, I'm sorry, I hate it when it does that. I'm sorry. 